All right, welcome everybody to uh, part four of our Understanding Google Workspace for Education Plus series. Uh, we've been running this for the last couple of weeks, uh, and today we are running, uh, our, our topic is data tells stories, and we'll be looking at analytics, and how we run analytics on school data, some of the stuff that's built into Workspace Plus, uh, and how you can get school insights, uh, or insights from that data. Uh, next slide, please, Joel. Um, and uh, just before we begin, of course, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet. I am currently on Larrakia country up here. I'm in Darwin at the moment. Um, but wherever it is for you, um, just want to honour the cultures that have nurtured and continue to nurture this land and honour the presence of the ancestors who reside in the imagination of the land. Um, we will jump to the next slide. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Joel Solomons in just a sec. So Joel is our senior customer engineer and knows way more about this data business than I do. Um, so I'm not going to even attempt to try and explain it. I'm going to hand it over to the expert. Uh, but just before I do, uh, if we go to the next slide, just remind you all that the Google for Education team is a small but mighty team. Um, we're based in uh, Sydney, Melbourne and Auckland. But we service the entire uh, country and New Zealand as well. Um, so that's us on the screen there. And just uh, next slide. I can just uh, just remind everyone that this is a special series of webinars that we've put together uh, for the combined powers of CENET and the Melbourne Archdiocese of Catholic Schools, um, as most of those dioceses within those two organisations have moved to Google Workspace for Educa Education Plus. And we just want to make sure that, um, you know, we're providing some opportunities for schools to learn about what the extra features, benefits and advantages are of having the Plus edition. So the last couple of weeks we've talked about um, uh, uh, meet. We talked about classroom, the originality reports. We did a security session with Rich. Today, you'll hear from Joel to talk about the data stuff. And next week, if you want to jump in, uh, I'm going to run the final session called Work Smarter, where we'll dig into all the other little bits and pieces of plus that are sprinkled throughout the suite. Uh, and there's a lot of little surprises in there. All right. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Joel and um, leave you in his very capable hands. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so yeah, name's Joel Solomons, um, customer engineer based out of Sydney, Australia, um, but I work across JPAC. So been at Google about 11 years. Um, majority of that time's actually was spent in, in Mountain View in California and also the UK in London, but happy to be back home in, in Australia. Um, and the reason I bring up kind of the international kind of side of my experience is that I luckily at the moment get to work across JPAC and then obviously get to work on very exciting data projects in the region, um, some which are very much cutting edge um, and a lot of which are just kind of ramping up now. So I'm very excited to be able to kind of speak to you about data um, and where that goes and kind of the benefits that we see in Education Plus. So let me kind of dig into it. And I always like to start kind of any data conversation um, with the idea that it's very much a journey. So when I speak to a lot of customers and so forth, they are all very excited by data um, and they kind of jumping or, or what we can do with that kind of amazing, amazing brainstorming sessions and so forth. But I always like to bring them back on like what you can do to kind of get started, which is kind of the crawling phase. Um, and then once you've kind of got that under your, under your legs as such, you can then move to the walking phase which is maybe you ingest third party data and I'll, I'll kind of go through these phases a bit further further along um, and then you can kind of get to the running phase which is all about insights predictions into intervention and so forth but I always like to bring it back to this kind of framework because sometimes we don't know where to start and, and hopefully by the end of this session today you'll know where to start that's my goal my goal is to basically say hey okay let's get started let's start the crawl phase with, with data because um, we can see the benefit there, and then that will set us up for the walk and run phases of the journey. So I would like to kind of preface it with that. So one thing, good thing to kind of understand is what data is available right now within Education Plus. Um, and there's kind of four sorts of, of data. There's apps and services utilization. So you, you can understand that's kind of how many people are using uh, Google Drive, how many people are using Google Calendar and so forth. We then have a huge amount of data relation to, in relation to security and audit logs. So a lot of that information is like, ah, what files are being shared externally? Is my domain receiving spam emails? How many files um, is journal 
made public, things like that. So that kind of data is available to them. We then have a whole array of uh, logs in relation to Gmail usage. This relates a little bit to security in relation to spam messaging and so forth, but also does a lot of email tracking. So you can see if emails, when they were delivered um, and so forth. And then last but not least is definitely the classroom adoption and attendance tracking. So this is relatively new, new data. Um, which is now available in the admin console and as well as I'll show you how to get it out of the admin console and that's in relation to what assignments are being created, which teachers are using Google Classroom and so forth. So how do you access this data? So there's a few different ways which you can currently do that. One, as I mentioned, the most common way is directly through the admin console. Now that's beneficial for administrators, but for teachers, they rarely have access to the admin console generally for good reason because it's more for the administration side so when i talk about administration i'm talking about it administration another way to kind of access this data or how do you access it is via the ability basically our entire platform has a thing called an api layer um, you may have heard apis a lot um, basically it's how programs talk to each other and what you can do you because uh, our um, platform is open for any of our customers it is possible to build your own custom development and basically um, trigger those APIs to, to send you data and then you can do some analysis on that way. A third way on how to access this data is which is included in Google Edu Education Plus is the BigQuery integration. So what this allows you to do is basically with a few clicks, just export all the data that you have within your admin console and put it into BigQuery. Um, and the reason why that's important is that then once it's in BigQuery, which is a storage layer, and I'll give you kind of an overview of what, what it looks like, a, an architecture overview, but what it means that then you can start visualizing that data and really start to run interesting queries across it and get insights. So today I am going to be focusing on the BigQuery integration or BigQuery export is the, the name of the feature as such, which is available in Standard and Plus. So, what does this look like from an architectural standpoint? And this is probably the most technical slide, and I'm going to make sure it's as easily digestible as I can. So in a normal data project, what you normally have and you start off with are your data sources. So what are your sources of data? And I mentioned them earlier. We have all the kind of workspace data and the classroom data, which is being created right now um, within, within workspace. Now, once you have that data, the next thing is where do you want to store all that information? So this is kind of your data lake. Um, in this, as I mentioned earlier, I'm talking about BigQuery today, which is one of the Google Cloud products. And basically, you can throw all your data into that, into that storage mechanism and then query it as much as you want. Now, the reason why if you have Education Plus, it's very easy to do that by the BigQuery export functionality that I just mentioned. So basically, within Google Workspace, you do a few clicks, and then that data will start being stored in BigQuery. Now, once you have the data stored in BigQuery, that's great. What are you going to do with it? So the next thing you want to do is be able to visualize that data. So we call that kind of the data visualization layer. And you'll see here, there's a few options to do that. So Google has a product called Data Studio, which is I'm going to show you a demo of today, which is completely free. It actually just recently got renamed into Looker. Um, and we also have a paid product, which is called now Looker Pro, um, which is also a cloud product where you can visualize that data. But once, once it's kind of in BigQuery, you also can use a third party option. So maybe you already have some visualization layer. Um, maybe Power BI is your visualization layer. That's perfectly fine. You can still use that within BigQuery and visualize the data as you see. So what's more interesting though, once you kind of understand that you've got workspace data, is then adding different data sources. And when I talked about the crawl, walk, run model, this would kind of be in the walking phase, is that once you've got the workspace data set up, you can then start adding this third party data. So maybe that's data from LMS, maybe it's specific grade data from a grading system that you have, could be attendance data, it could be data from your SIS, um, it could be NAPLAN data and so forth. So that's when it starts to get super interesting in relation to what insights you can get from the data. So today I'm going to focus kind of and give you a demo just on the classroom side of things. Now I did want to say, does anyone, please interrupt me if you do have any questions or so forth. We do have a Q&A section at the end, 
But if anyone has any questions about this kind of architecture overview, I'm more than happy for you to kind of jump in and ask me, put them into the chat, um, or if you're very brave, you can come off mute um, and ask me directly. So feel free to do that at any time. So the other thing we also, when we kind of look about a, a data project, just as I mentioned those different layers, it's very important to identify and scope as a first step on what problems do you want to solve from the data? So another kind of best practice, a lot of people kind of start a data project, but they don't know what they want to understand from the data. So it's very important to kind of go into a project with a specific question you want to answer. So as an example, maybe you want to understand what students have the highest attendance. And that's a very simple kind of data point, but it's also a very good way to kind of narrow the scope and make sure that's going to be so you can kind of measure success um, on any kind of data projects. Once you understand kind of the what questions you want to ask the data, you then want to identify what data sources they are. So in this case, as I mentioned, we're going to use on workspace. Um, is there no starting dash? I am going to jump into a demo, Milton, um, on exactly that. Um, so don't worry, I'll, I'll get to that. I'm going to do a live demo. So once you can then identify what questions you want to ask, and you then identify where those sources are coming from and what they're going to be. Then you can visualize the data, as I mentioned, through Data Studio or Looker or maybe a third party option. And then what happens is that you want to review those insights. Um, so whoever the stakeholders are of the dashboards, you want to basically gather their feedback from it. And once you kind of gather their feedback, you can then add more, more, to that, more data sources, be that kind of, as I mentioned, gray data or LMS data or so forth. And then you kind of create this loop where you kind of continually add more data sources and then continually get feedback from the stakeholders who are, who are viewing this dashboard. So it's a very kind of generalized project plan, but it's also good to kind of have a little bit of structure when we go into this. So what I'm going to show you today is what's ready to use right now with a data studio template. So let me just open a different slide. I'm going to go here and then I'm going to share a different tab in a second. So you should be able to it's redirect me right now. So you should be able, yep, you can see this right now, which is great. So what this is, is an existing template that our product teams have created to basically get you started with just a simple click. So this basically, I don't know if people have ever used um, Data Studio before, but, but as I mentioned, it's a free visualization platform. And just like kind of within Google Docs, you can create basically create a template and then just share it with anyone or make a copy of the, of the template and link it to your data. Now, what's happening in this case, the reason why I bring this up and it's very easy to get started is that with the BigQuery export, this template has already been formatted that you literally just have to make a copy and then with a few clicks, link it to the tables or the data tables which are in BigQuery, and then you'll have all this data kind of populated with you. So let's get started and I'll kind of give you an overview of how you can kind of visualize the data. Um, we we'll go for there. So first off, as I mentioned, it's easy to share documents or share templates just like Google Docs, just with a share button up there. So you could share this with only a specific subset of users, so maybe only certain teachers or maybe only the principal and so forth. You'll notice here you then have the ability to also set custom time frames. So when you set up this tool with BigQuery export, it goes back 180 days. So you'll basically have or over the net once you enable it, after a few days, you'll kind of basically backfill up as much data up to 180 days. So then you can kind of specify time frames from there, which is great. The other thing you'll note here is that the once you've set up the connection between this template or data studio and BigQuery it actually automatically starts pumping out the data and there's nothing that you need to do from an operational standpoint. So it's kind of set and forget. You enable BigQuery export, it will backfill the data and then you'll continuously sync the data um, and it's now in near real time. So it used to be every 24 hours, but the, the product team's done a great job of basically um, expediting that export. So it's basically near real time now, which is amazing. The other thing I wanna point out here is that a lot of schools want to the way that they're structured in the in the admin console is that they have many schools within one google workspace admin console and because of that you do have the ability to basically filter the data depending on organizational unit now you can understand here this is kind of uh, not real data you'll 
probably know the Harry Potter references here, but you, I just wanted to show you that you can, if you wanted to, only filter the data for a specific school or a specific OU. So what is the data telling us? Now, this is just classroom data, and it's considered the classroom engagement report. You can see kind of in the top left here. And what it's showing is basically, this is a very general overview of usage of classroom within your schools. So you can see here, this is a trend, and it's basically showing what the active roles are per user. So is the basically amount of active teachers increasing or decreasing? Um, and so for the amount of students. This one, this diagram here shows you actually assignment activity. So that's basically how many assignments are being published, how many are being returned, how many are being reclaimed. And then at the very bottom here, it basically just gives you an overview of activity within classroom. So that could be how many assignments are being posted, how many people in general are posting anything within classroom, and how many of those classes are actually active in that case. Now, at a very high level, this case basically just gives you a snapshot of usage. What I think is more important or more insightful is when you can click into the other areas. So if you click at the teacher's um, section at the top, you'll notice we have a few different menus here. Um, and again, you have the ability here to filter for a specific time frame, and you also have a, an ability here to filter for a specific school or for a specific organizational unit. And the one thing I always like to also say is that sometimes when you look at data, it raises more questions than answers. So always keep that into the back of your mind. But what, I, what this tries to show is that you are able to filter for a specific teacher. Um, and what it really shows is basically how many assignments are being published within Google Classroom. Now, why is that important? Well, it allows basically any kind of leaders in the teaching world to understand if certain teachers are using Classroom more than others, and maybe there's a professional development need or requirement there on why some teachers, such as Julie, aren't using or creating assignments. Um, or maybe they aren't returning any assignments and giving them grades. So it's a great way to initiate a conversation with that teacher on maybe understanding that they don't know how to use the tools and that's why they're not using Google Classroom. So this gives you an overview for each specific teacher. Um, you can highlight specific teachers and so forth. And as I said before, what I've seen this being used is just a first step on understanding is there a professional development requirement here for, for specific teachers. Moving across over to the students area. Now, this does a very similar thing to the teacher activity, but it's more basically about assignments being turned in and late submission. So, again, it provides you an overview of how many assigns, assignments were turned in for each or any specific user, um, how many late submissions they may have, um, and basically the overall activity for this. So, again, what this could do from a teacher's perspective is understand maybe there are certain students that are handing in lots of assignments, but a lot of them are actually late. And again, that initiates a conversation between the teacher and the student to understand kind of, to kind of do a deep dive there, um, to understand really what's going on and to provide extra context there. You do have the ability here to filter this per, per student if you wanted to search for a specific student, be that via their student name or their email address. Um, and again, it provides you with a, a way to start a conversation with the student. The third area here is classes. And what this does when it loads is basically you can understand what kind of subject areas are using Classroom and creating the most assignments. So regardless of kind of who's the teacher in these, you can kind of look at understanding that certain types of um, classes are using the tools more than others. So as an example, you can see here that the GG Smart Bootcamp, they've used a lot of assignments or they're creating a lot of assignments. Um, so that's probably and maybe there are other subject areas. So if I scroll down, you can see that um, <laughs> there's a lot of, sort of herbology. Um, that doesn't create, they don't create as many assignments in there. There isn't as many students in that class, um, and there isn't as many assignments returned and so forth. So this allows you to maybe see that maybe math subjects are using classroom more than maybe art subjects or vice versa. But again, it probably allows you to start a conversation to understand why certain subject areas aren't using the tools. Maybe there's a professional development need, um, but you can kind of dig deeper from there. So this dashboard I said is available for free. It has a kind of a, 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 a bit of an overview. Um, and I'll put a link in the chat um, just to kind of, so you have the ability to go here. I might actually just 
do that right now so you can see that template and then get started we'll make sure that's included as one of the follow-up resources um, that chris shares with everyone after these sessions joel we've also got a question from milton it's asking if this can be delivered by a school in a security group um, as in like the, the data studio template shared or the data filtered data filtered uh, by school yeah, so, yeah yeah yeah, gotcha. So at the moment, this specific dashboard only does it via the OU, the OU level. Um, you, one, it, yes, it's technically possible, so you can do that. The the thing that, that would need is some customization there. So you'd have to understand um, what the security groups are. Like they are exported in the in the export, but then you'd have to match them up um, to do some extra filtering. This dashboard by itself doesn't do that at the moment. No. Right, but this this dashboard is also active, right? So it's doing it's looking at what happened today, for argument's sake. Correct. It's near real time in yeah. relation to that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So that's that's kind of there is another dashboard which I'll show you, which is more kind of admin focused. Um, let me just get the link for that. It's another Data Studio template, um, which I'll open up here. And again, the good thing about this stuff is that these dashboards are open for you to customize as much as you want, right? So they're kind of like starting points more than anything I see them as. Um, so this is uh, another template that my colleague actually in London, Ollie, created. Um, and again, you have the, basically it's more about product usage than it is classroom. Um, but it does from an administrator, so an IT administrator standpoint, it does kind of give you an overview of like, what users, what are the max active daily users of our normal core services, how many documents, spreadsheets and slides are being created, um, how an overview of posts kind of is pretty straightforward here, um, and a breakdown of files per user. But the other areas which I think are kind of useful is understanding what types of devices are ac accessing workspace. So as an IT administrator, maybe you may be, most of your users are using Windows or, or Chrome, um, or maybe some other operating systems here. So it kind of gives you an idea as well as like, if you do have Chromebooks within your school an active usage overview of that as well. It then jumps into Google Meet. So how many Meets are being created, where are they joining, where are people accessing Meet from, which is quite interesting. And then kind of the top users within your organization. Um, whenever I've used, seen schools use this, it's always quite insightful to, to see who, how many, or which users are the highest users of Google Meet. Um, and then from a, another security perspective, you can have a look at kind of which third parties are accessing your workspace data. So as an administrator, you have complete control over if you allow third party access to your data, um, and this will provide an overview of what, you, what has been at, um, accessing your data overall. So you can see here, you can see what the kind of highest third party um, activity is, which is again, just more of an insightful spot. And then last but not least, it provides an overview of drive data. So how much how much drive is being used, how many files, there's a huge amount of like metrics here. You can kind of get a little bit lost in lost in the metrics. Um, but it's a really good starting point because all you have to do is basically copy this template and then link it to your data and it'll start populating. Um, so yeah, they're the two kind of fundamental dashboards which are available today. Um, let me just put that link in the chat as well, just so people have that as a reference if they wanted to take a look today. Um, and then let me go back to this one instead. So let me go to that and slideshow. So I copied those two links, and as I mentioned, we'll make sure that we send a follow-up email with them as well. So from a, from a standpoint, that's kind of what I wanted to show you. The main thing I wanted to do is make sure you're confident in this stage. So I'm gonna scroll back a little bit here because my goal is for you to get to this, this area. Be confident or be understanding that you can get started today in the crawl phase just by enabling the BigQuery export. Okay, that will send me twice, I'll update that. Um, that you can get started today by enabling the BigQuery export and then using those Data Studio templates to start your data journey, which will then progress, hopefully into the walk and run phases um, for it. So does anyone, I'll kind of pause there. Does anyone have any questions um, for this? 
Okay, yep, I got a cool question here. So Max have 85 or so schools that we have rolled out Education Plus. These schools have limited access to the admin console, understood. Um, so we have a central tenant. Would Max schools have access to these types of analytics or the super admins have to provide this data from the head office to these schools? So the way it works, so if you're in a set, if you have multiple schools in one tenant, then the super admin of that tenant would enable have to enable BigQuery export, and then that data would be starting to be flow into the BigQuery, which then could be visualized. So it is something the BigQuery export has to be enabled by the super admin of that workspace instance. Um, if that helps with with that, Richard, um, I'm just trying to make sure that does answer the question. Yeah, so the central tenant. So yeah, because it's an essential tenant, it's basically going to have to be enabled um, by the super admin of that centralized tenant. And I don't know if Kim. Hi, Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Sorry, I just said uh, hi, everyone. Sorry, I just I know just like oh, just come off a uh, mute and um, video. Um, Richard, um, the the Data Studio templates though, and obviously I joined late that Joel was showing. They have the same sharing permissions effectively as like a Google Doc. So once the super admin has enabled the BigQuery export, then the data studio templates can be viewed and accessed by people with different levels of permission. Is that right, Joel? Half right. It's half okay. right. 50%. 50% is better than zero. Yeah, exactly. So the super admin will enable the export of all the data so it's stored in BigQuery. Then once you with those templates, you have to have access to be able to connect it to the to the BigQuery. So in that case, the central team would basically create a few templates and hook that up that data up. So it connect, makes the connection and then share the template with you, um, so that you could view the data. So it's a, a bit more on a central central team to basically connect the data for those templates. But once the data is connected, they can share it to you as a viewer, and you you can view it without any issues there. Joel, I feel like I'm sixty percent right, at least sixty percent right, Joel. My answer. <laughs> Joel, I have a question because um, if I understand it correctly, the template that's provided that we're exporting BigQuery data into provides you with a easy like couple of clicks to get that visualization. But if you understand what's in that data that's coming out, and you understand how to use Data Studio. You could add your own pages and your own visualizations to that, right? 100%. So they're completely customizable. Um, so what we've created today is kind of just an out of the box experience that kind of gets you up and running quickly, which is the main goal. But you can, once you have access to the, those templates, and if they've given you, just like in Google Doc, you have view mode or you have edit mode, um, right? Um, if they provided edit mode, you can customize them as much as you want and then add additional data, right? There's more data in BigQuery here, which these templates are not showing. Um, there's just a huge amount of data there. So you have the, the ability to do as much customization as you want, even create completely new templates, link that to different data um, and aggregate that. So it's completely up to you. Yep, thanks. That's what I expected, but uh, good to hear it. Question there from Camille, uh, is there a limitation on how many templates can exist in a tenant? You're on mute, Joel. I'm on mute. I'm on mute. Um, sorry about that. No, there's no problems with scalability here. One one of the great things here is Google scale. There's there's no worries about how many templates can exist for a tenant. Kind of like there's not, well, maybe there is a limit on how many docs there are <laughs> available in Google Drive, but it's a limit you'll probably never worry have to about reaching. Um, so yeah, there's no, there's no issues there for, for template amount of copies and so forth. It's actually one thing we'd probably recommend is making copies and then creating certain teachers. Basically, you want to create certain templates for certain stakeholders, right? The IT admin dashboards are going to be different to what the teacher dashboards are. So you want to create kind of templates for each type of stakeholder. Yeah, I guess we were trying to avoid creating 150 templates for 150 schools if all we had to do was create one security group. I, I see what you're saying there. Yeah. So at the moment, what you at the moment you'd have to basically create different templates for those other schools um, and link them. Understand what you're saying? Yeah. Can you put it on your roadmap? 
I will definitely mark it down as feedback. So, and then, and then let me make sure that basically you want to control the view data based on the security group. Yeah, we want we want one template that all schools can see, but we only want the school to see their own data. Ah, uh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there, there is a there is a way to do that right now. Um, and, and what it involves is basically instead of using Data Studio as the kind of visualization and security layer, what you do is you actually create that security layer on the big query tables, which are kind of a layer below on the storage level. Um, and then once you do that, um, then whoever views the data, unless they have access to that underlying permission, won't be able to view it. But um, that's something we, we should definitely talk about. And if it's something that you need to get set up, we'll definitely get involved with a partner and we'll, we'll get that set up for you. Okay, thanks, Joe. Does anyone does anyone have any what's the word hesitation on 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 enabling BigQuery export or anything there? Because my the main goal is to make sure people are confident in 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 accessing this data and are having a way to visualize it. All in terms of the uh, walk and run stages, have you got any insights or stories or examples of other schools that have sort of moved into those other stages? Yeah, there's quite a few, especially there's a few in Australia um, and, uh, and definitely some in Japan and in India as well. So, yeah, so when it comes to those kind of additional walk and walk and run phases, um, the main thing that we've seen a lot of schools look at is NAPLAN data. Um, just because it's longitudinal, you have a lot of historic data there. Um, so we've had schools look at that and then look at quadrant data within that, within NAPLAN, which is quite powerful. Um, and then we have we have one customer. I, I don't know sure sure if we we'll say say them. Basically based in, in Sydney, which is which is amazing. Which is doing not only are they kind of providing that data, they're actually getting insights into the data, so they can look at kind of what are the main data points, um, be that attendance um, as an example, on relation to student outcomes. So one example that I found in their data is basically. Depending on what grade level it is, basically anything above year 10, the attendance doesn't necessarily relate to student outcomes, which is quite insightful. And from that insight, what they found is that basically they changed their, um, their school hours that they provided more free time to students for in year 10 and above to go and do their own self-paced study rather than having set classes. Um, so I found that was a very powerful insight from the data that they found tracking outcomes to to attendance data. Um, yeah, I don't know, Kimberly, if there's any other examples or, or things you want to bring up. I feel like we're moving into that space increasingly. Um, and um, what we're really seeing is, yeah, to, to Joel's point, that is when we start looking at this data in reference to other sources of data, um, that we're really finding it quite valuable. Um, so we're just um, are winding up a bit of a proof of concept around looking at um, growth based on achievement data that's ingested um, NAPLAN, uh, the ACER, like PAT testing, um, and another achievement data source that this school has, um, and workspace usage, um, and looking at correlations between achievement and the way that students are actually engaging with workspace tools. And so, you know, uh, something that we expected as an outcome, which is there, um, is that, you know, the student that actually has the highest achievement growth is also the student that has edited more Google Docs than any other kid in that particular um, group. And you would somewhat expect that, you know, as an ex-teacher, anecdotally, I would expect that a child that is achieving from our you know, standard achievement metrics is doing well, would be actively engaged in whatever tasks um, were there. And so the next layer down is how many of those uh, docs that this child owned, how many were collaborative with other students and those sorts of things is what we'd like to get to, which I feel is that might be, is that the sprint level, Joel, when we, when we start doing that level of analysis? I, I, I call it run. I'd still consider the run the run phase as well. But uh, maybe we do have to have a sprint phase <laughs> added to the slide. Yeah. 
I'd like a sprint. I always I always joke that I want Joel to jump straight from crawl to sprint. I'll skip crawl and walk, just go straight to sprinting because it seems really interesting what we could do if we're all sprinting. So well on that note, uh, unless anyone has any further questions, uh, I'm gonna give everyone back eight minutes. Perfect. Thank you everyone for the time. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out and Chris will make sure I send the right links uh, to the <laughs> thing of the recap. No worries. You forward them to me, Joel, and I will put them with all the other stuff. Uh, and, uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, you will find this recording along with all the other recordings on the, uh, the website where you registered to attend this, uh, but we'll be sending those out as reminders as well, just in case you've lost the link. Um, thanks for joining. We'll see you next week for our final um, webinar. Cheers. Uh, I think probably Joel. Oh, yeah, I can stop it. Can I? Hopefully, because Joel left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he started it, but yes, I can finish. Milton, I'm